So hi, I'm Emily Friedman with the University of Washington Alacrity Center today talking with Gina Su, a research assistant at one of our pilots, looking at treating patients with both depression as well as cancer. Today we're talking about contextual inquiry. Contextual inquiry is a human-centered design method that is great to use at the beginning of a project when you're in the discovery phase. It can be used to clarify what problems need to be addressed, develop a shared understanding with the stakeholders about what really matters, and define requirements for possible solutions. Contextual inquiry should not be confused with interviewing, though the methods work well together. As the name suggests, it focuses on context, observing people in their natural context, seeing their workflows, tasks, and responsibilities, and asking them questions to fill in the gaps. So Gina, you, you have experience in your project of using both interviews as well as contextual inquiries. What do you think are the benefits of using both? Right. Interviews are great for uh, helping you enumerate all the problems that um, in, are in the topics that you're interested in, but contextual inquiry really helps you uh, make those problems richer, in a sense, by uh, being able to observe those problems unfold in real life. I also find that when people uh, are answering questions, they may give you a more general answer or may not think through uh, certain work through workarounds that mm -hmm. they might be doing uh, subconsciously throughout the day? So I was observing a social worker um, and uh, she was approached by a nurse uh, who asked her to come to a uh, exam room right away. And when we went, um, it was one of the oncologists uh, who could not actually handle some of the, uh, the absences and uh, you know, not being able to follow up, uh, the patient's not actually following up. Um, and wanted the social worker to just take over and, and take care of it. Um, so a lot of the issues actually end up falling to the social workers um, as the dump, uh, dumping ground. So I was actually able to observe it. And not only that, um, because she was pulled away from her job and she didn't actually prepare for that, um, she didn't have any writing instruments. She just got uh, arrived at the exam room, so she pulled a uh, tissue <laughs> from one of the tissue boxes and started writing notes because oh, wow. she didn't have any instruments. So these are the kinds of things that you end up uh, observing that you don't hear from the interviews. Right, I could imagine somebody not thinking to report that if they were filling out a survey or right. being interviewed, <laughs> for sure. Um, were there any other observations that you experienced that are noteworthy? Yeah, um, so a lot of the social workers uh, mentioned that they didn't have a lot of time to do their jobs. And one of the things that I observed is that um, actually the sessions are being held in a different office or different building altogether from where they're sitting. So it takes them five to ten minutes to actually travel from building to building. Um, not only that, they don't have a dedicated office uh, to hold a session. So sometimes, you know, doctor's appointments get delayed. So if oncologist is running late, um, they have a, a room that they reserve for their session, and if they only have five minutes for, in that room, they actually get kicked out of the room and they actually end up having to hold the session in the hallway or just terminate their sessions earlier. So. Wow. A lot of the time when we talk to researchers about using these human-centered design techniques, uh, in healthcare specifically, we get pushback that they're concerned that the providers and the patients are going to be concerned about privacy. Mm -hmm. How did you deal with this in your project? Yeah, I think it, early engagement definitely. So we had, um, we approached different centers and administrators and different stakeholders at the centers early on, presented our, our project to them, what we're going to do. Obviously, there were a lot of concerns about the privacy of the patients and how we're going to be recruiting them. So working with them to figure out that process and actually helping them um, help us in a way to uh, recruit the patients and address their concerns was a big key. So you say that you worked with the providers to find some level of comfort for both of you. Did you have to make any compromises or right. what kind of changes did you have to make to your plan? Right. Uh, so typically you would have to get some informed cons uh, consent from the patient. So one way to do it is just show up and ask the patients, can I observe the session? Um, instead of uh, the providers were very uncomfortable of us doing that. So what we ended up doing is have the providers actually approach the patients you know, over the phone or during their prior sessions and ask, are you interested in um, having somebody come into your session? Have them think about it. And then if they actually 
are okay with it, then we can actually come in, give them the informed consent again, and then um, get their approval to, to make it easy and for them to um, know that we're coming ahead of time. And give them the opportunity to opt out without, right. having, without having to look at you in, in the eye. Right. <laughs> right, that's great. Um, did you experience patients who did not want to have UV? Yeah, um, so most patients were, were willing. Um, they're they're uh, willing to help, um, but there were some patients who weren't. And those patients, we uh, they, the providers were able to filter out even before we got there, so um, there were no uncomfortable moments. Great. Do you have any tips for conducting observations without interfering too much within the therapy session? Right. Obviously, it's a very private and sensitive uh, environment. So uh, what we try to do is not sit directly in front of the patient so we don't actually have eye contact with them. We want to make them feel like we don't exist. We're literally the fly on the wall. Um, so kind of creating a, setting up the chairs and the desks if you can in a way that uh, you don't actually look at either the provider or the patient directly um, mm -hmm. and taking quiet notes. <laughs> right, no, no clunking away at your keyboard, I imagine. And um, did you discuss with the providers after the patient had left whether they felt uh, it had impacted the way their patient had acted? Right, I, as, a, as a researcher, it's really important to, important to know if your data quality is good. So I made sure after each session if um, the session would have been done differently if I wasn't there. And obviously there are some sessions where the provider felt that um, the patient wasn't forthcoming. Um, so I noted that in my observations and um, wanted to make sure that I wasn't compromising the data quality. Great. So you can see from our interview with Gina today that while it can be more challenging logistically and there may be pushback you have to deal with, I, you, your project can really benefit from including contextual inquiry in with interviews. And one other thing that I'd like to mention is that they don't have to be done back to back. Sometimes it's valuable to just do the observation first and then go through your data and what you collected and that can help you figure out specifically what questions you need to follow up on, what you need to um, understand better, and maybe even other, other tasks that you need to now observe because you realize how critical it could be to your goal.